Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Tiffany asks, sexuality shows up in so many ways in your novel. In your opinion, does sexuality tell us something about humanity that other behaviours don't? That, yes, it, it, it really tells us how our pathological relationship to sexuality due to patriarchy and white supremacy and capitalism, how we have disconnected ourselves from a fundamental part of what it means to be human. Every species on this planet has a relatively natural relationship to sexuality. We seem to be, although they're, they're starting to say now, um, some primates have also problematic relationships to their sexuality, which doesn't surprise me because they're our cousins. Um, but we s stand out as um, making sexuality something um, that could be evil and hurtful. We, we rape and we um, condemn people for their personal consensual acts. Um, it's bizarre to me. We harm children sexually. We, we do these really bizarre things as a result of how we've been taught to think about sexuality as something dirty. Um, so we make it dirty because that's what we've been taught. And I, what, what I wish is for a kind of liberation in which we can have a more healthy respect and relationship to our bodies, other people's bodies, and therefore our sexual natures. Brilliant answer. And thank you so much for your courage, by the way, and sharing your own history of being a survivor. I thought that was really courageous of you to share that. Thank you. I feel very grateful. Um, another question, I can't see a name attached to this, but um, somebody asked, how far was writing The Prophets a cathartic and how far a painful experience? Um, it was equally both of those things. It was extremely cathartic to finally get what I felt was like a, a weight on my shoulders out into the world, because I felt like this is a story I had not read before. Although um, in the pro during the process of me writing this, um, playwright Danye R. Love wrote a play called Sugar in Our Wounds, which deals with a, a very similar topic about two enslaved men in love. And then of course, the absolutely brilliant and genius Marlon James wrote um, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, which goes back even further and queer puts an entire queer lens on um, ancient Africa. So I feel like I'm writing within a community. So I'm so happy for that. Painful because I was um, reliving what my ancestors endured to ensure that I would be here. They, you know, they, they survived untold horrors. And I had to sort of relive those things, reading the slave narratives and reading um, uh, race theory works about that period in history, it was quite painful. And I had to, um, at some points, because my skin started to hurt in, in some scenes that I described, I had to actually get up and go for a walk or go play with my um, nieces, nephews and nibblings and um, talk to friends or meditate to, to be able to kind of pull myself back and, and, and sort of heal. I think that really, you know, that's a, that's a brilliant test, testimony about the, the quality of the writing, it, it is so vivid and so real, it feels lived. Um, so I will once again urge those in the audience, um, if you haven't already gone out and bought it, well, ordered it, stayed in and bought it, I can't say go out and buy it anymore. Um, if you haven't already ordered it um, from your local independent bookshop, please do. Um, such a shame that we can't have these in person and have you signing these, signing these books, um, but hopefully one day. Yes, I hope so. Um, there's a question here from Millie Seward, who is the publish, uh, publicist at, um, at Little Brown. Um, hi, Millie. Um, Millie says, I was really interested in the gender roles in the tribe in Africa and was wondering if that was based on research. I would also like to hear more about the Kasongo, the Kasongo people. Will that be a prequel? Someone has asked me that question before about the prequel. And I at first said no, but I'm now percolating in my head because I would love to see King Akusa again. OK, so. What I discovered in my research about pre-colonial Africa was in fact that they had different ideas about gender roles and gender identity and sexuality. Um, and many different, different tribes had different ideas. So it wasn't just like, 
all of the tribes had the same idea. All of the villages, all of the peoples had the same idea. There were many different ideas that look so different from what we think about in the West. One of those things I found was that king was simply a title and it did not matter what the gender of the person who held that role was, they would be called king. And whoever that person was married to would be queen, whether they were male or female or other. Um, and the Kasango people are actually an amalgam of several different tribes that I um, sort of liked particular aspects of their thoughts about um, culture and gender and sexuality. And I sort of fused them together and invented the Kasongo people to um, hold all of those ideas as a way to contrast it against what we see in the West with this really dogmatic binary, um, uh, approach to um, gender and sexuality and gender identity and such. So um, the Kasango people don't actually exist. exist. Um, some of them are, are based on um, the Dagara tribe, which um, the Dagara were in the area that we now call Burkina Faso. And they had a, uh, a special place for queer people in their village. They were called the guardians of the gates, which is where I get that idea from where they were the ones that were the spiritual leaders who um, were the ones who uh, translated um, or held uh, court for um, here for the hereafter. And so um, just um, me using my creative license to sort of um, draw from history and get what I needed to um, create these people because as Toni Morrison says, I keep quoting her, fiction is not fact, but it is truth. And it, fe it felt true to me, you know, I was, when I was reading that, I was really struck by, um, in the Kasongo sort of passages, I was really struck by the, the, the multiplicity of the African culture that you, or cultures rather, that you, that you reflect on without spoiling it for, the, for, the, or for those of us who haven't finished it. There are references to um, different cultures, uh, different tribes having their different customs. Um, and what, one of the things in particular I loved was the reference to customs that the Kasongo tribe had for specifically for the reception of visitors. You know, we tend to think of, certainly in the Western mind, we tend to think of African and African tribes as being these really isolated, never saw the light of day until the white colonialists came along. But actually what you portray so brilliantly is the fact that there was communication and trade and um, interchange of ideas. And you know, of course there was among these people and, and, and that the white sort of the, the demons that come along are not the first people from outside of the tribe to come along. They're just the first people with their specific intentions. Right, and what I also wanted to do in those chapters was also not um, turn Africa into this one whole continent of um, idealistic fantasy. Africans, which that word is itself is sort of problematic because it takes over 50 countries and makes it into one, yeah. are, there's billions of people and with billions of ideas and thousands of different languages and cultures. And I wanted to ensure that, you know, we understood that they are not all the same. It's not just this big amalgam of black people. They are all different. And, um, we in the West have a problem with that. We, we really do, we really do. Yeah, in a very profound way, you know, you can't imagine Europe being spoken about with the same, in the, as, as a monolith in the same way that Africa is. We would never dream of it. Even Western Europe, we wouldn't talk about, or even the Mediterranean, even parts right. of Europe, we wouldn't talk about in that way. And yet Africa is this monolith that is quite static. So I think the portrayal that you've achieved in this novel is really, really profound and meaningful. Um, we've just a few minutes left, so I'm going to try and get through a few more questions. Um, da, 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 da. Um, so uh, somebody's saying, you mentioned that this book took you 13 years to write. Have you found that events have happened in the Black and queer communities in these past 13 years, which caused you to change or add or remove sections of the book? No. What I did find and here, here is something that people are not gonna believe this. There's a scene in the book where I write and Samuel's complaining in his, in, inside his mind, he's complaining about things. And there's one line where I write, he says, they put their foot on your neck and expect you not to do anything about it, something to that effect. People are gonna think 
I looked at the news and, and decided to incorporate that in. I wrote that before Eric Gardner was, was strangled by cops on TV, before um, the man in, in Minnesota was uh, put the knee on the neck. I wrote that way in advance. In fact, in one of the slave narratives I read, that was specifically described where um, the, the person telling the story said their master put, their, put threw them on the ground and put his foot on their neck. So what that goes to show you is that racism is remarkably consistent and repetitive and redundant and, and it, it, it unimaginative because it's doing the same things it was doing 300 years ago. So um, what I have found is I did not have to add or remove, remove anything um, because luckily for me, America is so predictable. Um, so I, what I wrote um, 13 years ago is still relevant because America ha has not and probably will not change. Sad but true. Um, I hope we can squeeze in just one more question. Um, someone's asking, how difficult was it to conduct research given the predominance of a white historical perspective in today's world? Hard. I, in fact, much of my research had to rely on oral histories, which are not given value under the Western gaze. They're thought of as, oh, that's not important. You didn't put it in a journal, then it's, it can't be true. But I went to, for example, Esther Arma, who's from Ghana, a, a brilliant um, artist activist, who said um, often Westerners will um, misunderstand what um, the history of Africa in terms of queerness because they asked the wrong questions. So she said, if you had asked her grandparents, what are home, do you have any homosexuals here? They would have said, no, what, what, what is that? No, we don't have that. But if you had explained to them what you meant by homosexual, they would have said, oh yes, love. <laughs> because to them, there was no reason to single out homosexuality. It was just part of the landscape. It was just normal, natural love and sex to them. So that was the most enlightening part of this research. And, the, and the, um, what was difficult was having to train myself to rely on that re research as opposed to, oh, well, it's not in a scientific journal, so it can't be true. I had to actually go to people who had the lived experience to tell me and, and, and took their, their words um, at face value. Absolutely, I mean, so, so true. And you know, Jennifer McCumbie, the novelist, also talks about the um, the sort of this this snottiness that people sometimes have when when talking about oral history, as though written history is somehow beyond suspicion, and right. uh, you know, as though as though there are there are not also serious questions that we need to be asking about that. Um, and I wish I could, I wish we could go on. I've got so much more to ask you, but unfortunately, unfortunately, it's now eight o'clock, so I'm just going to have to bring a close to um, this wonderful event. I just want to say thank you so much to the audience for, for coming along and for listening so wonderfully and for asking such fantastic questions. And also to Hachette um, and Thrive, but also in particular to Robert Jones Jr. who has written a fantastic novel and talked about it so eloquently this evening. Thank you so much. This, this has been an absolute joy and pleasure. I am so happy that you said yes to doing this. Um, I can't wait to read more from you um, because I think you're superbly talented, superbly talented. Um, and it is so good to know you, my brother, across this ocean. And I hope we get to meet face to face one day. And thank you to Hashchet for bringing us together and for everyone for showing up to um, see us have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very kind words. And I really hope we do get to meet again. I can't wait to read what you write next. And good evening. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Um, I'll see you all hopefully one day in person. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.